Um, all right, uh, we're actually, we're talking about marriage this morning, but I, I came across something this week that I can't stop laughing about this. Um, so, okay, there's a, a painting. You want to put the first picture up of the, okay, so this is a famous Russian painting. It, it's called The Three Figures, okay? And it's worth, it was insured at $1.4 million, and it was on display at a prominent uh, art museum in Russia, all right? Um, there was a new security guard that was hired not too long ago. His first day on the job, um, <laughs> apparently he got bored, and he decided to, this was a 60-year-old man. This is not a 17-year-old who was a security guard. He decided to take a ballpoint pen and to add his own thoughts. He didn't think that they should be without eyes. A $1.4 million painting. And this guy's got a ballpoint pen that he took from the souvenir shop, by the way. It was like branded with the art museum on it. <laughs> and he draws, he's like, you know what? I feel like this should, they should have eyes. And he drew, <laughs> he drew eyes on it. So I came across this story. This happened a while back, but I just came across this story this week. And I can't stop laughing about this. Like, I just, I want to interview this man. Like, I want to find out what it was that was going through his mind. Well, like, why? I mean, I... I'm with him. They look weird without eyes, but like his eyes did not help a whole lot. And then, <laughs> then this took me down this rabbit trail because I, I read this article on it. I was trying to find out more. This is really important information I need in my life. This is the beauty of the internet, right? And I go down this rabbit hole of, of art restorations gone wrong. Okay, so if there's one, here, there's a side by side. Okay, so this is famous. It's, it's made famous by the internet. It's meme. There's memes of this or whatever. Uh, so the picture on the left is a famous, <laughs> it's a famous painting of Jesus that was in a church in Spain, and there was a little old lady who saw that it was damaged and thought, this should be fixed. Like, somebody should take care of this. And she decided on her own that she was going to take care of it, and the, on the right is what it turned out as. So she painted that over the top. <laughs> Of that. This is like Pinterest fails on a really large, on a really large scale. Um, then there was another one that I came across. <laughs> so the statues on the left are the original. They're looking a little worn out and they needed some, <laughs> some freshening up and somebody decided to take care of it on their own. And that's what they, uh, that <laughs> it looks like a yard figurine. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> this is <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just having like a personal moment with this. This is, I think this is fantastic. Uh, th this is the deal. What you have, the reason why this is funny and it's also kind of soul crushing on some level too, is you have like, these beautiful works of art that have then just been turned into something that's not very beautiful. And we have been in a conversation about, uh, in this Loveology series, about our sexuality and about our relationships and how God has designed it to be this beautiful work of art. That the, the sexuality that we have been created with, it's, it's, a, it's how God intended for us to live. It's to point to him and his beauty and his majesty. And our relationships, our marriage, what we're talking about this morning, um, it's, it's the same thing. It's supposed to be beautiful, but what our culture ends up kind of doing is we kind of end up trying to put our own spin on it. We try to put our own take on things because, you know, God's way is kind of archaic and it's sort of out of date and it doesn't make sense for the cultural times and we end up with the three faces with ballpoint pen eyes drawn on it. We, you know, the, the Jesus picture that was just, <laughs> just massacred. I mean, it's so ugly, it's so hideous, you know? And so we find ourselves a lot of times with these relational issues and what, what our challenge is, is to come back to, okay, but what's God's design? What, his, what is his intent? If he's the author of all life, and he's the author of all humanity and all relationship, including our sexuality, what is that supposed to look like? And so we're going to dive into that this morning. I want to just throw this out. I, I, I do this frequently. We're always pulling from different um, writings, from different uh, teachings, from different pastors, authors, theologians, Bible commentators, those kinds of things. Um, and I'll throw out those names whenever it's, it, like, whenever it's important, whenever I'm quoting them enough or using enough of their material. And I'm just telling you right now, this sermon that I'm teaching, like, the heavy bulk of the content is pulled from a pastor in New York. His name is John Tyson. I just, it was a, every now and again, I come across a one message in particular that is, I feel like it's so powerful. It's something that we need to hear as a church family. And so just, 
when in doubt, assume that I'm quoting him, especially if it's profound. If it's not profound, then it was probably m my two cents that I added. It's the ballpoint pen adding the eyes to what, you know, the artwork of John Tyson's um, uh, sermon. So, so the, the passage for this morning, and I'm just going to warn you, we're just going to, we're digging into scripture this morning, all right? We're going to go context to scripture. We're going deep into it. That's, that's where we're going this morning. So Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21, this passage, it's uh, 2 verse 33, is going to be uh, it's going to be our, our, um, our framework for this morning. So Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Verse 25, Husbands, Love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, hearing the, this phrasing in here, I'm just real talk, okay? In our current cultural climate, hearing this phrasing, it can be kind of a shock to the system. You hear words, especially the first, the first few verses talking to wives specifically, submitting to their husbands. Those three verses, uh, you can kind of feel, the, if you're online, you don't know this, but you can feel the cringe in the room. I can feel it. I can feel the like, oh man, here we go. Like, where is this going? And like, there's kind of like, some tension building, like a what is going on here? You know, okay, isn't this, isn't this 2022 that we're in? Um, and, and so all of this, it's like, and the bottom line is these verses have been used over the years. They've been misused in a lot of different ways. And so there's this like, God, that's the patriarchy that needs to be smashed. Like that's, that's what needs to be happening here. You can kind of feel that in general in our, in our current cultural moment. And so here's what I want us to do. We're going to dive into these uh, verses, but I want us to unpack. We have to remember that this was not written to us. It was written for us, but it was not written to us, if that makes sense. This was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a very specific church in a very specific area of the world in a very specific time. Now, it's for us because we can learn through it, but it is not written to us in our moment right now. And so I, it will be beneficial for us to go back and to seek to understand who was this written to, why was it written to, and then when we understand that, to walk that truth back into our current cultural moment, into our personal lives. What does that mean for our own lives? So that's what we're, we're going to be doing. So here's the context, right? Um, in uh, this is written, this is the book of Ephesians, so is the church that was in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was massive at that time. It was the most powerful empire in the world um, at that time. So this is the third largest city, so think Chicago, okay? This is a booming metropolis in the largest empire um, in the world. Um, so there was all kinds of commerce. There was a banking center that was in Ephesus. A lot of times we think like, old school, like, culture back then, and we just sort of think there were a bunch of hicks living in huts and whatever else. And, like, these were, these were at that time, super advanced civilizations. Um, I mean, thinking out philosophically in ways that hadn't been done before. All kinds of stuff going on. So there's uh, a, a lot of commerce. There's a banking center. There was a very large schism between the wealthy and the poor. The city of Ephesus itself was organized around a, a female goddess whose name was Artemis. Um, we'll, we'll get to more about her in just a, just a moment, but the city was, was literally built around or was organized around the worship of Artemis, okay? Um, you have to remember that the, the uh, society in the Roman Empire was completely patriarchal, completely, okay? All about the patriarchy, unashamedly. Uh, so anytime you talk about submission, they knew what submission meant, and what it meant in that culture was that women were inferior to men, so, I mean, Aristotle wrote about this. He wrote about how women were inferior to men. It was obvious 
the way that the culture functioned, that men were out in front and the women were behind. The men were the priority. The women were not the priority. Uh, that's the way that it was. Now, you have to understand, Jewish culture had, had some of these same types of behaviors that was woven into it at this time as well. So there was actually a synagogue prayer in the Jewish culture when, when you would go to pray at, this, at the synagogue, at the place of worship, that the men would pray. And part of the synagogue prayer was, thank you, God, that I am not a Gentile, a, which is a non-Jew, that I'm not a slave, or a woman. So there's actually gratitude that you are a man and not a woman. Uh, a woman didn't have full say in Jewish court. We've t- so a lot of, if you come here on a regular basis, a lot of the stuff, even the context we're given for this passage, you've probably heard it before because we hit on it over and over again, uh, but it's really important for us to come back to over and over again. Uh, women didn't even have a full say in the Jewish court. They were kind of almost people in society, like mostly the way there, but not, not fully the way there. But what you have to understand is it was way worse in the Greco-Roman culture. Way worse in the Greco-Roman culture. So in this, um, in this area of the world at this time, and it honestly made genuine companionship between men and women um, very challenging, next to impossible. Greek women, so in the Roman Empire, Greek women were expected to run their home and care for legitimate children, uh, while the men were not only free, but it was just known they were going to do this. It was expected that they would be off finding sexual pleasure and sexual release wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted. In fact, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the pagan, the worshiping of pagan gods actually revolved around temple prostitutes and things like that that went on. Um, so you, you have all this stuff that's going on. Female babies were abandoned at a, at a far higher rate uh, during this time than male babies were. Uh, Greek men, on average, they married at age 30, and the females were married, uh, being married off at age 18. So you can even see just the way that life was being lived and what the expectations were were very different at the time. So the challenge of this dynamic um, in the homes was kind of obvious. I mean, the, the problem is, is, like, when you read things from this period of time in this culture, they believed in strong families. But the point of the family was to keep the family line going. It was all about legitimate heirs. Okay, so then you have, I already kind of talked about this, but Aristotle had written about, it was called the household codes, okay? So when the Apostle Paul is writing this, you have to understand he's not writing into a vacuum. He's writing into a particular culture that's dealing with all kinds of cultural um, uh, emphasis, all all kinds of cultural um, inputs. So, um, So he's, what Paul is writing is he is referencing, making reference to the household codes of Aristotle. Aristotle wrote specifically about how husbands and wives were to interact, how fathers and uh, and children were to interact, and how slaves and masters were to interact. And so Paul is trying to bring the message of Jesus not into a vacuum, but into an existing culture, and he's using the existing culture kind of as as a vehicle to get the message of who Jesus is and the way that Jesus intends for us to live, uh, into it. But, but I, I would be making the argument, we are making the argument, that Paul is using the household codes of, of Aristotle to get into the conversation, but he's actually subverting. And we don't hear that when we read this, but I'm going to try to help us understand that a little bit this morning. He's actually subverting how that culture functions. Now, also in Ephesus at this time, there was a growing feminist movement, um, which you don't think of happening until the 60s, the 1960s, right? But there was actually a growing feminist movement in the area of Ephesus at this time. Um, So Artemis was in some ways the god of, uh, the god that was, everything was organized around. Artemis was in some ways the god of of hunting, but she was also the god of of fertility and of childbearing, um, those kinds of things. And so as a result, some women in this time, when Paul was writing this, in the area of Ephesus, started saying that, you know, anything you can do, we can do better, kind of a thing. Like, they started pushing back against the patriarchy, and they started saying anything that men can do, we can do whatever they do. And so there's documentation of this. There are actually women that started doing things like hunting wild boars topless. Like, they were just like, we are liberate. You think it was only in the 60s that stuff was happening where, like, social norms were being cast off, and there was this pushback against the way that culture was, was pressing down on women. So they started doing things like that. They started trying to lord it over their husbands. They, try, they started initiating divorce, where uh, divorce was really a male-dominated thing. Men had freedom to do it. Women did not have freedom to do it. And women started pushing back, trying to leave their husbands uh, in different ways. They tried to distance themselves from their husbands. And the Romans considered this as a threat to their order. 
they, in essence, they felt like the, the Roman Empire was going to begin crumbling from the inside out, and they wanted to, uh, to restore order. And so when Augustus came into power, he sought to restore order through the Pax Romana. He wanted to restore order along the lines of the household codes. He felt that it was, what we needed was strong families, but in the mode of how they had always been seen as strong families, right? And so he actually started to levy fines against single people, people that wanted to just stay single because he wanted to push them into marriage. And then he levied really, really harsh fines on anyone that was seeking divorce, uh, any divorced couples. They were taxed and fined. Um, so it was this desire to bring together the Roman Empire around the traditional family structures. And then at the same time, you had the rise of cults in the area. And some of these different, these various cults in this area where Paul was writing to, um, they had they had strong ties to women's empowerment, um, and this all made Rome really nervous, okay? They, could, they, they felt like the empire was crumbling in a lot of different ways. So here's Paul is, and he's dealing with all of this. He's not writing into a vacuum. He's dealing with all of this, and he is seeking to take the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. He's seeking to take the good news of Jesus into cultures that have no framework for the good news of Jesus, and he's trying to call, call them forth and form them into the new humanity and the new household of faith that Jesus is bringing about by the gospel. And so Paul does what's called lifestyle apologetic. He brings the gospel to bear on a particular aspect of our lifestyle and helps us to see how it's different than what, like, God's kingdom is different than the kingdoms of this world. So the traditional household codes call on the male householder to rule over their wives, and their children. It called on them uh, to do that, and so Paul begins with mutual submission, which we blow by all the time, that first verse, Ephesians 5, 21, to submit to one another. And then he moves towards gentleness with children, and he calls us not to just rule over wives, but to deal with, he calls on husbands to deal with wives in love and in service. And what you have to understand is we read this passage and we cringe because of the verses about wives submit to your husbands. There would have been cringing going on in this original uh, audience in Ephesus. They would not have been cringing about the wives submitting to their husbands. They would have been like, yeah, yeah, we get it. That's what, that's how, it's kind of duh, right? They would have been freaking out about the portions that followed that, about what the responsibilities of a man, what the responsibilities of a husband was, in marriage. This is why, listen, it was shocking for the men of the time. This was revolutionary for women. This is why for the first 300 years of the church, women were flocking to the church because in the church they had an equal seat at the table. In the church, they were treated in one particular way. Even children had a seat at the table in the church. They would leave the church, they would leave the family of God and go out into the world and went right back into a different culture that played by a totally different set of rules. But in the church, there were opportunities for leadership for women. They had a legitimate seat at the table, and so uh, they, the women flocked to the church. That's actually part of what conquered the Roman Empire, what brought it down. It was not what they thought was going to be the issue, but it was the subversion, the slow subversion of a different way of life that the church brought to bear on the Roman Empire. Now, I want to get into this passage. So verse 21 frames up the entire passage. Verse 21 that says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That frames up the entire passage. And what you have to understand is this whole passage, what we're reading in Ephesians, it's part of a long letter, okay? So, and the phrase I want us to get is, is a spirit-filled submission, okay? Because in this letter, if you look at the themes of the letter of, uh, of, of the book of Ephesians, the themes are, that, let me just give you a quick overview. Chapter 1 is talking about God in an eternity past and his plan for salvation. Then it moves into this apostolic prayer that the Apostle Paul is praying for revelation for the people of God that they would have insight into who Jesus is. Then it talks about our sin and how great our sin is, but how great God's love is for us and how he has saved us from our sin. And then he shifts gears and begins talking about how the church is actually a new humanity, that it's what God is intending to do to restore humanity back to his original intention in the first place. And then Paul prays this beautiful prayer that we are to be saturated and inebriated in the unknowable love of Christ. And then chapter 4 is hashing out what it means. How do we actually become this new humanity, the body of Christ? And how do we reconcile with different social classes and different tensions that there are in the world around us? 
And then in chapter 5, he moves into what it means to walk in the Spirit and how we must walk in the Spirit in order to walk as children of the light. And it's in that moment that Paul, if that's where Paul locates this conversation on marriage, is in the middle of this conversation about walking in the Spirit as children of the light to the world around us. And so we have to understand that when we talk about walking in the Spirit, like we can think, you know, manifestations of the Spirit, we can think words of prophecy and powerful acts of faith and healing and all this other stuff, and that's true. But the Apostle Paul is writing this, and he's going, yeah, there are other things that we, we cannot generate on our own, and that's the key to this. The way that, that God is calling us to walk out marriage, we can't, it, idealism doesn't do it for us. I can't generate it on my own. We can't generate it on our own. It has to be the Spirit of God that he does it when he gets inside the operating system of marriage, when he's given permission and when he's given room to move in fresh ways in a marriage. The work that he can do, he can change the way that things happen. So, so let's dive into the text. Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, out of reverence for who? Christ. So it starts off with mutual submission, and we'll say spirit-filled submission. That the Spirit has to generate this in us. Out of reverence for Christ. So listen, the Christian life is fundamentally, honestly, it's fundamentally about self-denial. To walk in the footsteps of Jesus is to walk in the footsteps of self-denying. Read his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. What did he say? Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass, I don't want to drink what I have to drink right now. I don't want to do it, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. To walk in the footsteps of Christ is to walk in the footsteps of self-denial. It's about sacrificial love for the sake of others. And so you and I, if we're disciples of Jesus, if we're followers of Jesus, our primary identity as disciples is learning to sacrificially love everyone. That it would start with one another, with the body of Christ, but that it would move to even sacrificially loving our enemies just in the same way that Christ loved his people, but he also loved the people that were his enemies. And the goal in marriage is to make sure that that same sacrificial love that we're called to as disciples to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, that that same sacrificial love is mediated through Christ and it's brought to our spouse through us in the process, that the sacrificial love of Jesus is what our spouse experiences from us. This is our call in marriage as followers of Jesus. It's not about women doing this for men, and it's not about men doing this for women. It's about both men and women jumping headlong into submission to Christ, and as a result of submitting to the Lordship of Christ, we're jumping headlong into submitting to one another out of reverence for our relationship with Jesus. Healthy marriages have this sense of mutual abandon between the two of them. Now, Paul has this in other places. I'm just going to hit this really quick. This isn't a one-off for him. In fact, anytime he talks about marriage, he talks about it from this perspective, okay? Anytime he talks about marriage, he talks about this self-abandonment, this this letting go of your life, giving up your life for the sake of another person following in the footsteps of Jesus. So take, for instance, um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's this whole discussion on sexuality and marriage and singleness. It, you got to understand, this would have this would have made everybody's ears tingle in this culture, okay? So let me just read just a portion of the passage of 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3. It says, The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. And everyone would have been, okay. Verse 4, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. And they would have been like, duh. Yeah, that's the way that it works. That's how our culture has been built. This is the way that things go on. And then it would have changed, the room would have changed. As Paul continued, in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Now this, the women would have been like, what? And the men would have been like, what? Are you, like, are you kidding me? Like, you, you, have to, you have to picture in the Roman Empire, in this culture that they were in, for a Roman man to restrict his sexuality and to not only limit it himself, but to give authority over that to his wife, this would have been mind-blowing for people. 
And you probably would have had people in the home church throwing tables and being like, this is craziness. How, you know, this is chaos. How is this going to, we can't function. And then he continues, do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, listen, what you notice here is that Paul is starting with a tenant that that culture can understand and can get on board with. And they might not have even been doing it for the right reasons, but they were kind of moving in that vein to get buy-in. And then he's moving to the difficult conversation. He starts going, you know, wives, you don't have authorities over your bodies. Your husband has authority over your body. And everyone's like, okay, yes, like, okay, this makes sense. And then he's like, bam, nails you with like, wait a second, right? And then he's doing the same thing in Ephesians. He starts out by talking about submission. He talks about wives submitting to their husbands. But where he's really angling is towards the men in this passage. There's a reason why there's this much text about wives submitting to their husbands. And there's this much text talking about husbands loving their wives as Christ loves the church. Okay? So he moves into this conversation. And what we have to understand here is that this is interesting and we have to note it in our culture especially. Paul is making a point there, this response out of reverence for Christ where we submit to one another, the way that we uh, flesh that out, there is a gendered response. Men and women are equal in the eyes of God, but they are not equivalent. We are different. We are wired differently. And so the Apostle Paul's laying it out, and Jesus would have laid this out as well, that there is a different way that they hash out what it means to submit to one another. There is a gendered response. The way spirit-filled men submit to their wives is different from how a spirit-filled woman submits to her husband. Both mutually submit, but how they're made as image bearers of God as a woman and how they're made as image bearers of God as a man, it, it changes the way that they would flesh that out. So according to Paul and according to Jesus, Gender is not a tool of oppression. It is a gift of God to express the image of God and reflect Christ and the church in marriage. They're not interchangeable. And the way that we do this matters because we are supposed to be telling a different story about God. So I want to I wanna talk this morning about this passage in Ephesians 5. And I want to talk, we're going to start with the men. Men, how are we doing? You guys good? You ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And the women are like, yeah, talk to the men. <laughs> Somebody talk to this man sitting next to me or whatever, okay? Um, okay, so men. This is, th- these are the verses that are laid out for men. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Um, Husbands, love your wives. Okay, again, that's revolutionary in this culture. We hear that and we're like, yeah, you should care about your wife. Like, duh. In this culture, this would have been massively revolutionary. And especially, he's talking to believers here. When he follows it up by saying, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. They know what Jesus did for the church. So listen to that as going like, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) I know where that went. Like, I know where that took Jesus. Are you serious? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So in these verses, the the first point that we're going to pull is that the way that God calls men to mutually submit, husbands to mutually submit to their wives, is by giving sacrificial love. Now, we live in a culture right now, and I'm not going to bag on men, and I'm not going to bag on the culture, but we live in a culture right now where it seems increasingly more and more, like men don't know how to be strong men. I heard somebody coin the phrase man-agers, that there's like a generation of men who are men by their age and by their physical growth, but the way they're functioning is actually more like teenagers. And there is this mentality of, yeah, but what's in it for me? And how can I get what I want? And how can I be comfortable? And how can I be taken care of? And there's this mentality of, of it's for me. And our culture reinforces this when it comes to marriage. We look at marriage as like it's all about 
just satisfaction. It's all about what am I getting out of the marriage? You know, how, how, much, how much joy am I getting? How much happiness am I getting? Which is, which is not what Scripture talks about, the, the point of marriage being. Now, hopefully, if you, if you do it God's way, you do get enjoyment and you do get satisfaction. But it, so men many times go into marriage with, how can I get this woman to meet my needs? I mean, we might not ever say that out loud, but the message that the culture sends and the way that men tend to function, just mix that in with just the brokenness of humanity in general because of the curse of sinfulness. And what men end up bringing to the marriage many times is how can I get this woman to meet my needs? And Paul is saying, no, God's way is different. God's way asks a different question, not how can I get this woman to meet my needs, but how do I give up my selfishness? How do I give up my needs for the sake of meeting the needs of this woman? That's a totally different way of looking at things. Completely different way. Now, if you notice, he says here, husbands, love your wives. He doesn't say husband. Now, we're reading a, a, an English translation of Greek text, okay? So there are multiple different words for love, and they indicate different types of love. He does not say husbands, eros your love. Eros, I mean, eros, your, your wives. Eros is the romantic kind of love, okay? The sexual kind of love. He's not saying eros, your loves. I mean, your wives. Because dudes would be like, yeah, I can take care of that. That'd be awesome. Like, I, you know, yeah, God commanded me to take care of that. I have to do it. He's saying agape, your love. Do you know what the word agape? Agape is the love that God has for us. Agape is the word that's used when we're told that for God so loved the world that he gave himself up. He gave Jesus his only son. He emptied himself and poured himself out. For God so agape the world. And Paul is saying, husbands, agape your wives. How do I give up my selfishness? How do I put my needs on the back burner so that I can take care of the needs of this woman? Then he continues in verse 26, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So Paul is, he's mixing, he's talking about marriage, but he's talking about this picture of Christ and the church, and he's going back and forth between the two, and he's saying, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And what we have to understand from this is that Christ has a vision for the church. Christ has a vision for the church, and he died to present the church in its splendor. Do we realize that? And many times, men, we can go into marriage thinking that our wives exist for us to present us in our splendor. And the culture around us says that, and sometimes the church has said that. And there's sort of this, this mentality, whether it's spoken or not, that's like, I'm a man and I know what I want to do with my life, and I'm going places, and I'm doing things, and what I need is a good woman who can help me. And we're like, you know what? Behind every strong and powerful man, there's a strong and powerful woman. She's making it happen behind the scenes, you know? And like, guys, you might not say that, but this mentality of it is all about me and the vision that I have for my life. I'm looking to be presented in splendor to the world around me, and I need somebody to help me do that in my life. That is the opposite of the way that God looks at it. God looks at it as going, yeah, your wife is to be presented in splendor to the world around her. And your goal is to figure out how you can present her in that splendor. Your, your goal and my goal, our assignment, is to ask questions about how can I present my wife in her splendor. To be asking our wives, what are the dreams that you have for your life? Are there giftings in your life right now that you're, you don't feel like you're able to exercise those things that you, you want to move and grow? In those? Is there a way that I can help you do that? Are you wanting to go back to school? Are you wanting to start a career? These are conversations that we need to be having, and it needs to be all framed from this position, this posture of, of men coming to their, women, uh, to their wives and desiring to present their wives in splendor. 
So, I, I, like, guys, you, we have to ask ourselves this question. This is, this is a question that we should ask ourselves on a, rec- on a regular basis. Would my wife say that she is thriving because of me, or would she say that she's thriving in spite of me? Would my wife say that I'm flourishing, and it's, it's not, like, not that her identity is rooted in me or any of that stuff, but that, that she feels that my life is, is working towards her flourishing, or is it I've had to find ways to flourish outside of that because I'm not receiving that from my husband. Guys, we have to ask ourselves those. If we love Jesus and we want to honor him with our lives, we have to ask these kinds of questions. So the next verse is all about a satisfying love. Verse 28, he says, In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. There are two words there. He says, um, um, they feed and care for their wives. And the traditional translation is they nourish and cherish. Guys, we're called to nourish and cherish our spouses, our wives. That's the call of God on our lives. And it can't happen outside of the Spirit of God animating us and helping us, but that is the call, is to feed and to care, to nourish and to cherish, to satisfy our wife with our love. So men, questions that we need to ask ourselves every day. Not all marriages, but in your marriage, with your wife, with that woman that's sitting next to you, how do I nourish her and cherish her? How will she feel that and experience that? And our call as men is to submit our need for satisfaction, to submit our need for affection, to submit our need for affirmation, to submit that to Jesus and to trust him with that and to pour all of our effort and all of our energy into meeting those needs for our spouse. Now the hope is that that's reciprocated, that we would mutually submit ourselves to one another, but that we would bring those needs to God first and foremost and to pour ourselves out for our wives' satisfaction. Men, if you were to ask your wives, would she feel that this is true? of you and I. Would she feel that's true? Now, women, I understand that this can still, like, first of all, guys, how are we doing? (laughs) We okay? You can talk to me afterwards. (laughs) It's fine. Uh, Ladies, how are we doing? You guys are doing good, aren't you? (laughs) You should be (laughs) with what we're talking about, right? Okay, here's the deal. Now, as we dig into the ladies' side of things, I understand that it can still feel kind of almost triggering in some ways to hear the verses about wives submitting, even though we've just talked, we've laid out what it means for men to do that. It can still sort of feel like, yeah, because it's sort of like I've seen the end of this movie. I know where this goes. And it can kind of feel like I don't know that men are capable of, of having that kind of respect or that kind of submission without distorting it, without taking advantage of it in some way. And I want to just reiterate Paul is not talking about women and men in general in the world. He is not saying that women are to submit to all men. All women are to submit to all men. That's not the context of this passage, right? I mean, there's nobody, I don't think, that would say, oh yeah, I mean, so just because I'm a man, women need to submit to me. That would be absurd, right? So we're not talking about men and women in general out in the culture. This passage is about submission in the context of marriage, a spirit-filled covenantal union before God. And who is the wife supposed to submit herself to? Not just any man, but a man who is under the lordship of Jesus, who is mutually submitted to her. That's who the call is for the woman to submit to in this passage. So listen, there can, I I understand that this is triggering, okay? What you need to understand is all throughout 
church history, there have been examples of the way this is supposed to be. Even in the Old Testament, you find examples. This is not, this doesn't mean that women are like, you need to be located in the home, submitted to your husband, barefoot and pregnant, and that's the way that it needs to be, and you just need to crank kids out, and that's your calling because you're a woman. That is not what is in the text of Scripture, okay? Go back into the Old Testament. Let me give you a real quick example of this, okay? Talking about women and all the different roles and all the different ways that they can function. Real quick, I want to clip through this. Oh my gosh, we're already, oh my gosh. Okay, I'm looking at my timer. Okay, Proverbs 31, verse 13. A wife of noble character who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her, her life. Now let's unpack what this can look like for a woman, Okay. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She's got an Etsy store on the side, okay? <laughs> She's like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She's got a farmer's market stand that she does, okay? She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She's a manager. She's in leadership. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She's in real estate. She dabbles in wine, okay? This is what she does. <laughs> She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She's a crossfitter. <laughs> she sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. She's a commodities broker. <laughs> In her hands, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She's a skilled artisan. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She sits on the board of a nonprofit. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. She's stylish. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She's in retail. Uh, she's clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She's got confidence. She speaks with wisdom and faithfulness, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Obviously, that's a graduate degree in English. Uh, she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She's a domestic manager. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. She's got influence in society. Now, the bottom line is, in all of that, still, there is a call in the New Testament, in the kingdom of God, for wives to be led by the Spirit and to submit themselves to their husbands. And that word submit is a Greek term from the military. It's a military command that means to line up. So what is she submitting to as a wife? Not to rules, or commands, she is submitting herself to a man who is dying to himself to present her in all of her splendor. So anytime you hear a man who would say anything like, woman, submit, the woman needs to reply, man, die. Okay, <laughs> this, is, this is the way that it's laid out in scripture. Yep, women submit, and men line up to die. When I, first, like when I was younger, I really struggled with this scripture passage before I understood all the, all the context and everything. <clears throat> and my like, most rudimentary way of being able to explain it before I understood all the context was m like reading this passage, it just looks to me like we're both supposed to be submitting to each other. And if there's any privilege that the man gets, the privilege is that he gets to go first in dying to himself. That's it. That's about all I can sift through of any kind of privilege that's there. Right? So there is this fear for women, and many times it's justified. And I understand there's pain from relationships that have gone wrong, from divorce or from abusive relationships, or from, you've been, ladies, you've been around inconsiderate men. They've been controlling, or maybe you've, you know, dealt with a man-ager. But the bottom line is this is part of the fall. Part of the fall, the issue we're told in Genesis chapter 3, we're told that this is, God was speaking to Eve, and he said, your desire is going to be for your husband, but he's going to rule over you. It's not the order that it's supposed to be in. That's the result of the fall. And so there's this constant struggle, and in Christ, we are called to lay down that struggle, to mutually submit to one another, for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. 
And for women, we're told in Ephesians 5, 33, the tail end of this passage, however, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. You must respect your husbands. And let me just say this, ladies. The world, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make a sob story for men, okay? Don't hear me doing that, okay? The world is a challenging place, though, for men right now. The world does not know what to do with male energy. It's seen as a threat, and it's seen as dysfunction. And it doesn't help that men don't know what to do with male energy either, not helping ourselves in that way. But there are many men that struggle to know how to do this right, how to really die to themselves, how to serve their wives and to pursue them and to love them well. Male energy is seen as a threat and not as a gift. It's seen as something that's broken or that's wrong. And so let me, let me just say, submit to you humbly, ladies. If your husband, this verse about wives respect your husbands, if your husband is moving towards you in any way, if your husband is seeking to walk out this kind of self-sacrificing love in any way, move towards him respect the effort. Like, it, you, can't, you can't be like, really? Your idea of date night is Culver's and eating it in the parking lot? Like, that's, that's, that's a date night? Like, you can't. You got to give the man points for trying. You got to respect the effort. I'm, I mean it. In general, the way to get the best out of a person is not by being sarcastic or cynical or judging. The way to get the best out of a person is to encourage them to show respect and honor. That's the way to do it. And so when guys start to move in this way, and it's like this is a different operating system both for men and for women to do this right. But as men move into this, it's like this can be clunky and it can be awkward. And this verse is like respect them. Respect the effort. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge it. That's the way to move and to grow in a healthy way. Marriage is meant, and here we'll, we'll wrap this up. Marriage is meant to be, the bottom line is marriage is meant to be a portal back to our artwork at the beginning. Marriage is meant to be a beautiful work of art that points to the beauty of Christ and the church. The way that God calls us to live is meant to be this mutual submitting for the benefit of the other, this beautiful portrait to the world around us of the goodness of God towards his people. It's an invitation for spiritual formation, that the way that we would learn to love each other would actually form us spiritually in our relationship with God. And it's meant to be mission, that the example that we live in marriage shows to the watching world around us. If we do it right, if we do it right, the world ought to not really have a framework for how we're doing stuff. They ought to be looking at the way that we're, what we got going on and going, what, what, do you, what is this? Like, you are submitting to each other. You are loving each other. You are, you are, like, it's like the Canadian standoff. You know, like, the door gets opened up, and two Canadians are going to walk in, and they both just stand there perpetually going, no, after you. And the other one's like, no, after you, because they're so nice. They just, no, after you. And nobody wants to go for, like, this is marriage is meant to be this constant, I'm, no, I'm going to submit and surrender to you. No, I'm serving you, and I want to present you in your splendor. No, listen, I want to support you and serve you in what God's called you. Yeah, but I want to do that for you. It's just this constant, that is what the call of Jesus is for us as husbands and wives. But the world has this mentality that's all about, well, you just find your soulmates, and it's about your satisfaction, and then we have this ridiculous list of expectations. It's Jerry Maguire, you complete me, you know? Well, nice, lay that at somebody's feet. Like, then we lay those expectations at the feet of somebody who's broken and imperfect, just like we're broken and imperfect. And we expect them to be our everything for us and meet all of our needs. And it's an impossibility. It can't happen. It can't happen. And that's not intended to be what marriage is. So, uh, I, wanna, I want us to, uh, to pray to close. But before I, I do, I want to just real quick, here's, here's your practical takeaway. This is your challenge. Husbands and wives, I want you to do an experiment. Give as an experimental gift to your spouse. For the next 30 days, give them the gift of living this way. Give them the gift of, like Paul said in, five, in, in Ephesians 5.21, of mutually submitting yourself 
to the other. Don't discuss it. Don't talk about it. Just do it. Don't expect it from the other person. Just do it. Give yourself Give of yourself for the other person and see what God can do over the next 30 days. So husbands, to be asking yourself questions like, okay, listen, I'm sacrificing, I'm presenting her in splendor, I want to nourish and I want to cherish. And for wives to say, I'm going to work to respect and to submit to him. As you do that, just see what God will do. See what God will do. And for more practical outworkings of learning to to mutually surrender and respect and to love and to honor each other in this way, get to the marriage workshop that we have going on on February 28th and on March 7th. It will be worth your two hours of time each night. Kurt and Julie have a, a, a lot of experience. God has done amazing things in their marriage. They bring a lot to the table. We have them speaking for a reason, okay? If you want practical tools, that's where you're going to get practical tools. This is the framework for us to function in, all right? So let's pray. God, we thank you for the beauty of the way that you love us through Jesus Christ. The, the, the beautiful picture of Christ and the church. God, we thank you for that. We pray that you would shape our marriages in such a way that the world won't have words or a framework for it. God, that there will be such confusion or wonder about the way that the marriages in this church function, God, that people would be drawn to you. I ask for that, Lord. Pray that you would soften the hearts of husbands and wives, incline them towards each other, God, that as they dive into submitting to you, that they would be diving into submitting to each other, God. Empower and encourage men to lay their lives down for their wives. God, empower and encourage women to willingly respect and submit to their husband, God. And we pray that you would be glorified in all of it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning. We'll see you guys later.